presentation. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for the introduction, Isoldo. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Professor Sasso Isolar and Pablo Pariu at MIT, as well as Deniz Yanvanlı at MIT, uh, who has been, uh, who is a wonderful PhD student, advised by myself and Asu uh, for his uh, master's thesis. Uh, so today I'll be talking about incremental algorithms. I'm lucky that people have uh, made the introduction to these algorithms and I can sort of count on the previous sort of background uh, for, some of, for, for these algorithms. So I will be maybe uh, just uh, reminding you what uh, incremental algorithms are and what we want to do here. So essentially we are interested in an optimization problem that has this additive structure. This is no surprise to you, you know, in this today you have, we have seen a lot of these these kind of structured uh, problems, especially uh, when you are dealing with distributed optimization, obviously uh, you, will, you can sort of have a local cost function fi uh, for agent i, uh, but if you want to do um, sort of global decision making, you will be looking into this kind of editor problems. But obviously these problems come up in many platforms, especially uh, data analysis is like a a standard place where we would have these problems. Uh, today we have talked about wireless networks, uh, we have talked about distributed optimization problems. So I guess I don't have to really, you know, try hard to convince you that, you know, this is a sort of a relevant uh, problem to look at. Uh, so it comes up in, in many places, especially also in uh, stochastic optimization because of the fact that you can replace expectations with uh, sort of finite sum averages. So, okay, so how do we solve these problems? Essentially, um, incremental methods have been sort of successful to solve these problems um, if you have a lot of functions. So imagine that you have 100,000 functions. Uh, the classical methods such as uh, gradient descent, how do they work? You have to construct a gradient of the objective, but this requires you to really pass through all of these data points. Or um, I'm using data points and function a little bit interchangeably uh, because just to sort of visualize the problem a little bit, so you can think that um, maybe if you have data points and you have a model that you want to fit, uh, so you can think that for each data block you will have a loss function that tells you how your model is sort of fitting to the uh, data. So uh, for this talk you can think that I'm interested in data analysis where basically each of these sort of component functions that I'm talking about here, FIs, are associated to some uh, data blocks and you can think them as sort of loss functions, okay? Um, so how do we solve these problems? Essentially the idea is that if you have a lot of functions, the sort of uh, simple methods like gradient descent will have extensive steps just because of the fact that you have, you have many functions. So they will not scale uh, with the number of functions, FIs, that you're interested in. So the incremental method, the idea is that you just say, well, I'm gonna have uh, cheaper steps that are approximate so that I won't have to wait for the computation of the full gradient. I will just basically uh, sort of um, uh, process all these data points or if you wish functions in a, in a sequential manner. Uh, actually Alejandro I think gave the sort of introduction to these methods so I can be a little bit faster here. But the idea is that uh, you, let's say if you are talking about first order methods, um, you just replace the standard gradient instead of the gradient uh, of the objective what you are doing is you are, you are using the gradient of individual functions and you are sort of processing your data points or your functions uh, in, a, in a sort of uh, sequential fashion. And why is this good? Uh, especially in distributed optimization, you might have privacy constraints. So you might not want to really share, uh, you, might not, you might only locally know FIs, so you might just want to work with FIs locally. So uh, this comes up in sort of privacy uh, type of problems. But also if your data points are sort of coming in a sequential fashion, uh, these are sort of, um, sort of really natural methods to, to look at. And they are sort of used uh, pretty much everywhere in machine learning and uh, sort of in data analysis problems. So, so how do they work? Um, the question is that, so you are given a bunch of data points and sort of some data points will be more important than others. So there is the natural question that we want to ask, like, what is the right order to process these functions? Okay, we talked about sequential processing, but still, uh, I didn't tell you sort of what is the right way, uh, sort of what is the right order to visit these data points, if you wish. 
So the deterministic methods, so one thing you could do is you can say, well, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna use deterministic methods. Uh, the way they work is that you, you say, well, I'm gonna have a cyclic method. I'm gonna pick the first function, then second function, third function, and I will repeat it in cycles. So this would be the sort of uh, uh, classical incremental gradient method where essentially uh, you are sort of taking the first function, take a gradient step, take the second function, take a gradient step, and so on. Uh, so you are following this deterministic cyclical order, um, which essentially can be slow in, 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 in some time. So you can think that uh, your consecutive gradients uh, might be small. So, it, so in, in other words, basically, for the deterministic algorithms, you can really construct some worst case examples that in the worst case, the deterministic methods can be really slow. But if you sort of know a lot about the structure of the problem, there are all also some very good orders that can be pretty fast. So in some sense, the deterministic orders, if you wish, can be fast or slow, depending on the nature of the problem. In general, if you know nothing about the problem, then you'll say, well, I will just randomly sample my data points. So I will pick a, pick a data point or function, I'll process it, and uh, in the case of stochastic gradient cell, what you are really doing is essentially you, have, you don't have any memory, right? Uh, you just pick a function, take a step along its gradient, you pick another function, and you repeat, right? So when you look at you know, the order of processing for these functions, you will have these, you can essentially see repetitions, because when you are working with data points, you, you have absolutely no memory, right? Uh, another thing you could do is you can say, well, I want to avoid some kind of repetitions because I have already visited some data points. So I'm going to do sampling without replacement. Uh, so you, you, you can think that you have a bag of functions, you are sampling, but you're avoiding repetitions. Right? Uh, this is known as the random reshuffling method because you are sort of, what you're actually doing is you are taking sort of permutations of your data points. So if you wish you have the memory, you sort of, um, you sort of visit your data points, and then basically the sampling without replacement is gonna correspond to taking essentially random permutations of the order. Uh, why random permutations? Because essentially you cannot be repetitive because of the without replacement sampling, but also you will have a random nature. So in some sense, this method here without replacement sampling is something in between. It looks like deterministic because it, you don't allow repetitions, but it looks like random because each cycle you have a random permutation uh, of your data points. Uh, there are other things you could do. So if some problems have a network structure, for instance, um, you know, we have, to we have uh, talked about uh, wireless uh, network problems, um, in, or you can think about sensor networks. If you have a particular network topology that's static, then when you're passing information, you have to be really sticking to the topology of the, of the problem. Um, so these orders are sort of uh, more like network impulse in the sense that you, know, it, you have to, um, so you have to sort of uh, stick to the, uh, so you have some constraints in other, in other words. So then the, the big question is, what is the right thing to do here? I mean, should we do deterministic? Should we randomize? You know, what is the right thing to do? And in its generality, no one really knows. So even though we have, you know, there is exciting recent work on higher order methods, um, uh, and some, there are some nice algorithms, but even for, for very simple first order algorithms and simple quadratic functions, we, you, we don't know which one we should do for a given problem. So if you give me a problem, is it possible that, you know, what happens? What should we do, right? In particular, stochastic gradient descent method is, is well studied, going back to the 50s, but the random reshuffling variant uh, is not well understood. Uh, so today I'll be talking about uh, that direction a bit. Uh, so essentially what I'm gonna do today is that uh, first I will be sort of talking about deterministic methods, the incremental uh, deterministic methods. And as we will see, the performance will depend a lot on the order that you are picking. So we will get some convergence guarantees that really depends on what order you are picking. 
And then um, I will talk about how to leverage these analysis uh, to understand the random reshuffling method uh, in the context of incremental gradient. Essentially, we will be providing the first asymptotic uh, rate results under some assumptions. And um, why are we doing this? Essentially, it, uh, so experimentally you see that random reshuffling works much faster than uh, stochastic gradient descent on many problems. And uh, by just changing the sampling, you can get some acceleration and we want to understand is, uh, you know, what makes, how can you sort of get better algorithms by changing the sort of sampling. So I will give you some rate results about random reshuffling. And then, uh, as promised, we will switch to coordinate descent. So I will argue that uh, there is this class of uh, algorithms called coordinate descent methods, which also do sequential optimization. And interestingly, uh, for, for a class of interesting problems, uh, we will be able to construct an optimal order. Meaning that, um, so given, given a problem, we will be able to say, uh, we will be able to say what is the best order that you can, you can take that would beat any kind of randomized method uh, that, uh, that can beat pretty much like the standard random order. So in other words, we will be able to compare all these, maybe let's forget about the network ones, but um, in the centralized setting basically, uh, I will describe some problems where we can really compare these methods and then show the benefits of shuffling or without replacement sampling. Uh, and basically, um, why are we doing this? Again, basically, if you could really sort of construct a nice order for incremental methods, if you would, then uh, basically we will argue that you can be really faster than randomized methods. So that's the sort of, that's the sort of the idea. Okay, so essentially, uh, why are we even looking into this? So this is a slide to say that sort of incremental gradient has been used in, in, in several places in the literature, in applications. Uh, first of all, when you are training um, sort of um, deep networks and one, uh, so stochastic gradient have been sort of uh, used uh, successfully in training deep networks. So basically this is an algorithm that you will see um, in many uh, applications uh, such as training of deep networks. But it has also some fundamental uh, connections to, uh, to sort of solving linear systems. So if you have um, a linear system of equations um, there, there are this class of um, methods called Kachmarsh methods, which are essentially some role projection methods as we have seen today. So you can argue that there are some special cases of incremental gradient methods. And today I will also argue that coordinate descent methods are also a special case of uh, incremental gradient methods. And uh, in that sense, you know, these are problems that are sort of, um, uh, sort of problems that you will see in different places. Okay, so about incremental gradients, essentially I will be talking about some uh, deterministic results. So uh, this is uh, basically, this is an old topic and incremental gradient have been widely studied. Essentially the best rate uh, results were due to Angelia here uh, at the back and uh, Dimitri uh, Barsekas. This is about incremental gradient back in 2000. Uh, and uh, under the strong convexity type of assumption they were able to show that uh, distance to the optimal solution uh, scales by one over square to the k. And I was uh, thinking whether uh, there's any way to get better rates if you would assume more on the, on the sort of smoothness or structure of your, uh, of your functions. Uh, and so just to introduce some definitions, um, so we will be looking at the strongly convex problems, although you could extend some of these results to sort of weakly convex problems. Uh, so C is your strong convexity constant. We assume that uh, gradients are Lipschitz, meaning that uh, gradients are not moving uh, too fast. So this is, um, this is also sort of a uh, standard assumption you'll see in, in the literature. And, and also we are not assuming these things at the same time, but we, will, uh, we, also, talk, uh, we also introduce the definition of uh, the subgradient boundedness or gradient boundedness, which tell you that sort of gradients are not growing, so they have some, they have some, some bounds. 
Okay, so what do we do? So, so ba basically, for this talk, you can't, you can't think that we are working with uh, smooth, strongly convex functions. So essentially, they look like quadratics. Um, you can think quadratics as a simple example to sort of understand the results. Uh, but rather speaking, we have some upper bounds that, uh, that improve the existing results. Uh, and you have this distance k is like your um, suboptimality after k iterations. Um, and we, we can show that basically it decays like with rate 1 over k as opposed to the previously known best rate 1 over square root of k. So one problem here, as you can see, we have an m on the right-hand side that can be large. So why is this? Because uh, deterministic methods, when you work with some convergence guarantees, they have to work with any type of order. So whatever you do, uh, you can have really unfavorable orders. So, so these are a bit like pessimistic, but we will discuss uh, how to improve these upper bounds if you would be randomizing uh, your order. Okay, and uh, so in these results, one thing we had was basically here we are assuming that we are using some step size, something like R over K, and um, you could, we have also analogous results with other step sizes, but uh, one question here is that to get this resu result, you need the step size parameter R to be sort of tuned to the strong convexity parameter. And one question you can ask is, that, is it an artifact of this analysis or is it more like you know, a property of if you, uh, you know, incremental gradient? And then you can construct some examples that really, you know, uh, incremental gradient can be slow, so this is not an artifact of our analysis. So you, you really need to sort of uh, adjust your step size if you wish uh, to, to do strong convexity if you really want to use 1 over k type of step size, where k is the sort of cycle number. But then uh, it turns out that if, if you sort of use a slower decaying step size, then you can sort of, you don't have to worry about this adjustment. So the idea is that you still use a decaying step size that decays like 1 over k, but it decays a bit slower. So you pick s, the decay parameter, to be less than 1. And then for this step size, essentially you don't need sort of tuning, if you wish, to the strong convex parameter. So you can get... Uh, you can get upper bounds that are, uh, that are more robust, if you wish, even though you don't know the strong convex constant. So again, why do we care about these things? Because this is more like you want to, you want to know where you, want, where you need to stop. So these are sort of telling you how many iterations you need to take uh, if you were to sort of uh, reach to an epsilon sort of solution. Uh, one thing interesting is that the question is like incremental gradient, how bad it is, is a function of the order that you are following. Imagine a case where all of your functions look very similar. So incremental gradient will look like gradient descent. So you won't have this like big constants on the right hand side that I was talking about, right? So, so then um, one thing we haven't seen in the literature was that there was no performance guarantees that are, that are essentially depending on the order you are following. Maybe some orders are really nice, some orders are bad. Like can we distinguish between these, these things? So in the worst case, this constant here will scale linearly with m, the number of functions. But it can also be staying more on the order of a constant in the, in the nicest case. So what we did here was um, for essentially for uh, strongly convex functions, uh, uh, no, essentially here we are just playing with quadratic functions that, uh, that, uh, that are simple, but the idea is that to get some, some more intuition uh, about the general case. So for these, uh, so this would for us apply to Kachmar's type of methods uh, because essentially incremental gradient is equivalent to Kachmar's um, for quadratics. So then we can get some some bounds that are sort of telling you how well you are doing depending on the sort of order you are picking. So one, one problem here is that, you know, these constants will look a bit ugly to compute. So it has this Hessians, it has this gradients, uh, but we can have some tractable sort of, if you relax these constants a bit, you can have some uh, tractable constants that depends on the Lipschitz constants of your individual functions. And why do we care about this? 
because uh, using these sort of upper bounds, we can also design orders uh, in the sense that basically uh, we can, for instance, this, this would suggest that we should be sort of uh, processing the functions with higher Lipschitz constants first. Uh, so basically, um, you have a sum, and if you want really these constants to be small, um, we realize that like larger, larger uh, Lipschitz constants will have a larger multiplier if you are processing them later in your cycle. So basically, by doing this kind of analysis, we can, we can accelerate sort of the standard sort of algorithms that, uh, that would employ sort of incremental gradient type of algorithms. So this is, again, standard. Uh, basically, if you just want to do something like text classification, and if you, so, so for instance, uh, you compare stochastic gradient descent with uh, random reshuffling method that I was talking about. So these methods, here you are interested in the text classification problem. Um, these methods are exactly the same, except that the one on the right is using a without replacement sampling strategy. The one on the left is using a with replacement sampling strategy. Otherwise, everything is the same. And what happens is that numerically, you see something like 1 over k rate for the IID sampling. And you see something like 1 over k square for the, for the, uh, for the without replacement sampling. So, so the problem was that why is this happening? And we wanted to understand the difference. Of course, uh, about stochastic gradient descent and its you know, higher order variance, there's a lot of exciting work here. Uh, for instance, uh, like Alec has, has some work on it. You know, Alejandro has some work on it. So essentially understanding you know, incremental uh, methods and higher order uh, sort of versions is a, is a problem. So this, uh, if you wish, incremental gradient is a block of some other methods. So you want to really see what you can do to sort of accelerate uh, incremental gradient type of methods. Uh, so, so the classic theory says, so you can ask like how fast is stochastic gradient descent? And here, I'm not really talking about sort of statistical accuracy. And I'm, this is more like an optimization talk, if you wish. And you want to achieve the optimum. So what you do, so one thing you could do is uh, you can say, uh, well, I will, so in stochastic gradient descent, um, you have multiple uh, choice of step sizes. But uh, one thing you could do is you can say, I'm going to use the step size 1 over k to the s that I was talking about, and I will do averaging. So you can show that this, this leads to some state-of-the-art convergence for stochastic gradient descent. So in other words, um, in stochastic gradient descent, people have already worked out like what is the best step size to choose. And the existing theory, there are different choices, but you know, this is one way of you know, getting optimal performance. And the existing theory roughly says that you know, when you do the scaling, your errors will look like Gaussian. And the convergence is happening with rate 1 over square root of k. So if you wish, uh, I think my, OK, now it works. So this term is like your approximation error. right? And you are having convergence in distribution to some Gaussian variable. And the convergence is happening with rate 1 over square root of k. Okay. Right, exactly. So one thing is that if you don't take averages, uh, you don't have the optimal convergence rate. But you can do all these things with other step sizes as well. Okay. Uh, but so with uh, random reshuffling, what's happening is that you can show faster convergence because the S for us is like a step size parameter that can be close to one. Right. So it, it can be. It's like your design parameter. Technically, it can. It's. It can be as large as one, so you have faster convergence. And essentially, you have a stronger convergence. Here, you have convergence in distribution, whereas here, you have like a, more like a convergence with probability one. So with stochastic gradient, essentially, if you do random reshuffling, you are not only converging faster, but you are converging in a strong, stronger sense. Okay. And um, so 
these results are asymptotic, as I mentioned, but I will also talk about some non-asymptotic results. Right? But I hope the picture is clear. Essentially, uh, because the sort of uh, stochastic gradient might be slow, we are interested in sort of alternative uh, techniques where we can get uh, faster convergence. And the argument is that you could get uh, faster convergence by, uh, by, by reshuffling uh, at least asymptotically, basically, if you have enough. Okay, so so then this is just an illustration. Basically, if you have, you just look at your gradient, you look at your approximation error. So for um, for the reshuffling method, you have smaller uh, smaller approximation errors, whereas for stochastic gradient descent, you have like these larger errors. And when you do the right scaling, stochastic gradient errors look like more like a Gaussian, uh, whereas uh, for random reshuffling, you have this concentration phenomenon. So your errors, if you do the right scaling, they converge to a point. Um, so essentially, um, here you, you see a symmetric distribution in your errors, whereas in random reshuffling, you might see some non-symmetric sort of behavior. So they look different in some sense. Uh, Okay, but um, so why is this happening? Uh, so it's, it's more around the variance reduction type of ideas uh, seen um, in statistics. Uh, so what's happening here is that, roughly speaking, if you are working with stochastic gradients, your error is centered. So they have all, your gradient errors have all, always zero expectation. Right? So you, you, you don't, in expectation, you don't have any error. Uh, but your variance is sort of, fluctuating around the constant. For instance, if you would just take a two by two sort of, um, so if you have just two functions, you can see that your gradient errors behave like a Bernoulli variable, plus or minus one. So you, your gradient or errors have always like um, a variance that's on the order of a constant. So this is more like um, what you would have in stochastic gradient. In random reshuffling, it turns out that you have this bias variance trade-off, so you have a bit of uh, bias, meaning that you're, you have no reason to have unbiased gradient errors now. Uh, but uh, essentially, you are sort of um, sampling everything correctly. The only error that you have is, is because you are moving while you are sampling these gradients. In other words, you don't sample your gradients at the same point, but rather than that, you you move and sample these gradients at different locations. That's why your gradient errors will look like a difference of, uh, difference of um, gradients evaluated at different points. Uh, but one thing is that since at each cycle you are taking a random permutation, essentially there is some IID component in your, in your process. So if you just uh, think about cycles, they behave in an IID fashion. So it turns out that you can sort of decompose your gradient errors as sort of something IID and something sort of complicated, which is less important. But because we can analyze the deterministic methods that apply to pretty much any order, we can sort of take care of these less uh, important parts, if you, if you wish, um, using the deterministic analysis. And we can, that's sort of the basic idea so we use some concentration uh, techniques and so on, but that's the big picture. And so one thing that's nice about this is that because we know sort of what is going to happen to your gradient errors, I was talking about the fact that they are biased, right? Because, because you can sort of estimate what is the bias, essentially you can subtract the bias in your computations and get a better method. So in other words, we have an algorithm that can improve the classical random reshuffling method based on subtract, subtracting the bias in your computations. Uh, one thing is that, so for this to scale, you need, to, you need to have a bit of structure in your Hessians. So it doesn't apply to arbitrary problems. Uh, so you need to have either low rank Hessians or some fast uh, Hessian sort of vector products, but uh, so this, this also worked in like a larger scale experiments that, that we have done. Okay, how, how many minutes do I have? Three, 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, any questions from about part one so far? Okay. So, okay. So, essentially, the message of part one was, what can we do to sort of improve stochastic gradient? Okay. One option: these results tell you that you can shuffle. Okay. Okay. But um, the thing is that the analysis, as you can see, can get quite complicated. It turns out that things are a bit simpler if you are looking into coordinate descent method. So I will argue that coordinate descent method is a special case. Why is that? Because in coordinate descent, what you do is you pick a coordinate and descend in that direction. Right? So if you are randomizing in expectation, you have zero gradient error. So in, in other words, um, it looks like essential stochastic gradient descent in some sense. So, or you can think that in each coordinate you have a function, fi. So what you are doing is you are decomposing your function in coordinate descent as a sum of fi's, and each fi is like corresponding to coordinates. So co since coordinate descent is, a, is the same idea as a sequential optimization, basically there's a way to interpret this as a spatial case of incremental gradient. And there has been a lot of, uh, lot of interesting work on this. Again, you can do a similar thing. So you could do cyclic coordinate descent. You could do shuffled coordinate descent. Or you could do randomized coordinate descent. Actually, Mingi has a, has a nice paper on uh, coordinate descent methods. Uh, so it took a lot of time for people to analyze this uh, or to get results about a cyclic version of coordinate descent. Um, there has been some work on the random uh, orders as well. But roughly speaking, Currently, uh, the best known, so currently there's a gap. So essentially, the deterministic algorithms are, the bounds for deterministic algorithms are order of n square slow compared to randomized ones. So in other words, if you look at upper bounds, the deterministic coordinate descent method look really bad. And uh, essentially, uh, there's a recent paper by Roy Son and Yin Yu Ye that constructs these examples. So in other words, if you look at worst case performance, the deterministic methods are really bad. But in practice, they look pretty great, actually. So if you try this with some random data points or, uh, and essentially, I was working on coordinate descent methods for solving uh, Laplacian systems, LX equal to B, that comes up in, in sort of distributed optimization problems. And I was realizing that basically the deterministic methods always work faster than, uh, than the randomized versions. So then the question is that, is, it, is there a niche class of examples where the worst case for deterministic is still better than the randomized case? So some of the results in the sort of literature seem to be really not in favor of the deterministic methods. So it, it turns out that basically, when you are dealing with Laplacian-like systems, you can make the argument that deterministic is good, basically. And then you can design the best cyclic order to achieve the best performance. So in other words, when you are updating your coordinates, the question is, should, I, should you do x, y, z, or should you do y, x, z, for instance? Uh, and it, in, in, in practice, there's a big difference in performance. It's not about constants. It's, it's, it can be quite big factors. So it turns out that um, there's a characterization of the best thing you can do for uh, Laplacian-like problems that arise in classification or in machine learning. I will talk about some applications later. Uh, but um, so this is really a simple problem that I'm considering for the talk. Um, you, you are, let's think about you are trying to solve LX equal to B, but this is like a quadratic problem. But you can always sort of you know, center your problem so that it will really look like a simple quadratic like this. So A is, is, is your Hessian. You are looking at X transpose AX. And the question is, what should you do? Should you do uh, deterministic coordinate descent or randomized coordinate descent? You know, which, which one you should pick? And um, let's just normalize the diagonals to be one, uh, just to sort of normalize the problem with. But you can do it in its generality full generality in general. Uh, and here, I will assume that this is strongly convex. So very simple problem. The question is, you can think A as a sort of a Laplacian matrix. Uh, but 
here um, I am assuming that things are essentially invertible just for the presentation. But um, uh, essentially the problem is that we have, a, we have a sort of quadratic optimization problem. So then the question is, how do we compare these methods? So first of all, interestingly, coordinate descent is the same thing as gauss seidel method for solving linear systems that have been studied in the literature. So, and then there's a nice way of writing your iteration matrix in coordinate descent. It will look a bit ugly, so what you do is you decompose your A as something like identity minus the sort of lower and upper tridiagonal tri uh, sort of decomposition. Uh, it's like in this, you know, it's like a simple decomposition and there's a nice way to write it as you can, there's a nice formula for the iteration matrix, but it, it looks ugly, it has this inverses in it. Uh, for RCD, for the random coordinate descent, if you just think about the iterates in expectation, there's also a you know, way of writing what is this iteration matrix, right? At the end of the game, for this model problem I described, these are, you can explicitly write down these things, right? So then the question is, how are we gonna compare these methods? So the previous talk was talking about spectral radius as an indicator of sort of convergence rate. So you can make the argument that uh, spectral radius is, a, is an indicator of asymptotic convergence. The idea being that essentially you're interested in how sort of, how the sort of distance to your solution decays, but if you are taking some kind of average sort of decay rate, then you can show that the spectral radius is the right thing to look at. So then the question is, how are we gonna compare the spectral radius of you know, two methods? Can we compute these things? Okay, so one problem is that the cyclic coordinate descent matrix can be pretty much arbitrary. It doesn't have to be symmetric. Actually, it is not symmetric in general. It can look like a non-symmetric, non sort of very bad looking matrix. In general, you, we don't have, have tools to compute its spectral radius. So in other words, uh, oh, even though this, you know, randomized uh, iteration matrix is simple, it's symmetric, uh, we don't know much about the sort of the cyclic version. It can be pretty much anything. But, that, but then when you look at something like a Laplacian-like matrix, you have off-diagonal sort of entries to be negative. Uh, so when you look at this class of examples where basically your off-diagonals are negative, you can think about Laplacians. When you write it down, interestingly, you get positive matrices. So your cyclic iteration matrix becomes a positive matrix. So entry-wise, what I mean is that you don't have negative entries here. Uh, and then for non-negative matrices, we have some tools that we can use um, to analyze the, the sort of um, spectral radius. In fact, for this simple example, we can see that the improvement of uh, coordinate descent, the cyclic version is at least two, basically, just by a direct computation for the simple, simple example. Uh, so, so essentially the thing is that you can generalize this, and I won't get into the details, but roughly speaking, doing spectral analysis for randomized methods is easy because everything is symmetric. You can compute all the eigenvalues, and essentially you can write down a formula for the spectral radius of the randomized case. So, so then uh, for the cyclic uh, method, you just need some technical assumptions. Uh, first of all, we wanna use Perron frobenius type of theory, so there are some technical assumptions that people use. Um, so essentially for, we know that for positive matrices, they have some you know, positive eigenvalue and positive eigenvector, uh, but if you have zero entries in your matrix, then you have to get, you have to assume more, basically. There are some technical conditions called irreducibility that you have to assume, but these are essentially not a big deal in the sense that it tells you that your communicate, if you think the graph of your matrix A, it should just be a connected, basically, uh, matrix. And then uh, this is our main result, Basically, it tells you that the convergence rate of uh, coordinate descent has some lower and upper bounds. So basically, 
whatever you can pick whatever order you want, but you can never um, beat this rate basically uh, the lower amount you have, and uh, and there's a characterization of the order that hits that rate. So if the order that you are picking up is so-called a consistently ordered met, uh, it's a consistent order, then you can so. For us to be able to hit this lower bound, it turns out that your order has to be a consistently ordered, uh, it, it has to be a consistent order. What does it mean? If you think A as a graph, so each matrix is associated uh, with a graph, the graph should, should be bipartite. And essentially your order has to be doing these sort of updates from left, right, left, right type of fashion. So in other words, uh, for the lower bounds uh, to be hit, you really need to specify uh, some special uh, condition. Uh, and uh, why is this important? Because it tells you that whatever you do, it tells you that basically it gives you a characterization of the, what is the best thing you to, you to do, if you wish, uh, in, in cyclic coordinates. And the only thing is that these conditions are hard to check. In other words, we have like a characterization of the best order, but if you ask me compute it, then you have to do some approximation sort of algorithms, and that's some, some ongoing work here. Uh, but I, I won't bore you with the details, but the idea is basically if you, whenever you want to co compute spectral radius of a positive matrix, you can sort of uh, relate it to walks over your graph, so for your um, matrix A, you construct a graph, and basically it's, it's all about sort of uh, leveraging some sort of uh, theory for uh, positive uh, or non-negative matrices. But what is, what is interesting here is that um, you can show speed ups that, is, that can be arbitrary, meaning that there are some class of problems where so we know that there are some problems where this uh, shuffling type of ideas won't work that much. But we can essentially argue that um, for Laplacian-like systems, deterministic, any order deterministic method is better than the randomized uh, fashion. And we also have a way of sort of characterizing the best, um, best order. So these are some numerical um, illustrations. And just let me say a word on applications. So we, it was a surprise to us, but apparently um, the classes that we were working with appears in Gaussian belief propagation. So when essentially you want to do inference on graphical models, so our results hold for Laplacian-like matrices, uh, but they call this in this literature as non-frustrated models. So essentially, basically, we just realized that our results have some implications or some sort of practical implications for Gaussian uh, belief propagation models. And obviously you can use this in sort of consensus type of protocols. So you can sort of, if you, can, if you know what is the right edges to ad activate in consensus type of problems, then essentially you can apply these results to sort of that kind of scenarios. Um, I won't get into this, so we have also some results for aggregated methods, uh, but uh, I won't have time for it. So just um, to say a final word, so basically, um, so there are still a lot of prob open problems about first order incremental methods. And uh, essentially, we, we see both theoretically and numerically that uh, the order to process your data points makes a big difference. And we have developed some theory to sort of explain it and sort of to design better algorithms. Thank you. Ah. And also let me add that this was, I didn't have time, but essentially we have also a non-asymptotic theory, which tells you that when we compare these methods, it's not only asymptotically, but uh, you can also do these things in a more like a non-asymptotic fashion, like step-by-step -step type of, for, um, for diagonal dominant matrices, we have a non-asymptotic theory. So I have a more sort of a practitioner's question, which is that if I'm a practitioner and I don't know how to find the best order, right. I mean, then 
So, so we have some work. Right. I have to do some work to find out what the right order is, otherwise I could have a bad order. So, right. So one thing that we are working on currently is sort of think about an adaptive algorithm where we have some uh, metric to measure the performance, right? So think about updating it. You, you start with an order and you sort of try to randomize, make choices randomly and then measure that quantity. Is it going up or down? So based on that, you can design. Uh, so, so basically, uh, we have some numerical experiments that show that you can do better by sort of optimizing the sort of metric that I was talking about. But if you really don't want to do anything, what you can do is that um, you could also, there are some methods, so for instance, you could compress your, um, you could try to, uh, so there are some projection techniques where you sketch your data and uh, you try a few orders and take the best one type of approaches. The practitioners sometimes, they would um, take multiple, they, they would try multiple things and take the best order. Uh, but, so basically, but uh, there are some ways of designing it. So that's also like a future work. So basically, can you sort of, um, so in the analysis, we have some bounds that sort of reflect on the order for both cases. So we can do some heuristics and they work. Uh, so we have some heuristics for these things to work uh, better than you know, uh, anything naive. But um, you know, it's not clear whether you can develop a theory, but I can tell you more. So basically, um, you can do some approximation type of ideas. For practitioners, you have some. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Me, yes. Yes. So you can extend this to, uh, let's say, if you have LX equal to B, L is not, you know, X transpose LX is not strongly convex, but you can still sort of look at the N minus one sort of subspace. So you can extend this, but it doesn't work for arbitrary, you know, convex problem yet. Right, exactly. For instance, uh, also in your paper, the uh, gap is order of N square for quadratics, whereas in general it's order of n cube. So quadratics is a bit special, but one open problem is, can you do something more than quadratics uh, for this? Yes. 